Check, check. Check, check.
Grace and peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And good morning. morning. Welcome uh, to worship here on this Trinity Sunday. My name is uh, is Kevin White. Uh, For those who may be joining us for the for the first time, uh, I'm the pastor here of uh, of Calvin Church. Um, And uh, on behalf of the whole congregation, welcome uh, and welcome one and all to worship uh, this morning. It's an exciting morning. We have uh, we have a guest preacher this morning uh, that many of you will know, uh, Jordan Ravenel, uh, who uh, who grew up here uh, at Calvin Church. Uh, He's the son of Kim and Todd Ravenel. Um, Jordan lives in Virginia uh, and is a a seminary student down there. Um, You may uh, uh, you may have seen a note uh, in the newsletter periodically from him. Calvin Church helps uh, support him uh, with his seminary studies. Uh, and he is visiting uh, his family this weekend, and uh, part of seminary is getting experience preaching. Uh, so uh, when he asked about preaching while he was in town, we said, yes, absolutely. Uh, so Jordan, welcome. Uh, it's good to be worshiping with you, and uh, it's exciting um, uh, for you to be preaching this morning. I'm excited. So it is uh, indeed the day that the Lord has made. Uh, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's pray. O God, we marvel at the mystery, at the majesty of your name. You are both infinite and intimate, unknowable, and yet you have made yourself known, transcendent but imminent in the world. In love, you have have made us and made us your own, and you invite us into your divine dance. We will never truly rest until we rest in you. Let us learn to do so even now as we worship. Blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Assisting in worship this morning uh, is one of our deacons, Linda Tent, uh, and she will now be leading us in our call to worship. Good morning. Please join in our call to worship, which comes from Psalm 8. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? Yet you have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Please stand in body or in spirit as you are able and join in singing Spirit of Living God, which you can find in your hymnal 322. Oh, fresh on me, sweet. 
may be seated. about who we are created to be. You have crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. This is who God has created us to be, but we do not live up to or live into this calling or purpose or identity in how we live in the world or in our relationships with one another. Please join in the corporate prayer of confession printed in your bulletin or on your screen. This will be followed by a moment of silent or personal confession. Let us pray. O oh Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Yet we put aside your majesty, seeking our own power and gain. We set aside our responsibility for the earth entrusted to our care. We disregard your image crowned in every human being. In this we sin against you, ourselves and one another. Restore us in our life together, the divine image you intend. Make us tender in mutuality, generous in equality, grateful in our diversity, that all may find the flourishing you intend. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. In the name of Christ, we pray. In this letter to Romans, the Apostle Paul assures us, Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. Beloved of God, the grace of Jesus in which we stand calls us into a renewed right relationship with God and therefore with one another. Receive the good news. This is Jesus Christ. We are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be to God. heard, uh, we have um, forgiveness and we have peace uh, with God and with one another through Jesus Christ. And so may the peace of Christ be with you. I invite you now to take a moment uh, and share the peace of Christ. Uh, turn, uh, those here in the sanctuary, turn and greet one another um, near where you are sitting uh, with the peace of Christ. Those worshiping at home, you are invited to do the same in your household or perhaps even uh, right here through, uh, through Facebook, through comments. Uh, let us be a people who share the peace of Christ. Our scripture this morning is from the letter to the Ephesians, chapter, chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. If you would like to follow along, this can be found in the Pew Bibles on page 193 in the New Testament. As we prepare to hear God's word, let us pray. Holy and triune God, speak that we may hear. 
illumine that we may understand, encourage that our faith may be bold, empower that we may live out your word to us. For you are our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. Amen. Ephesians 3, 1 through 13. This is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. For surely you have already heard of the commission of God's grace that was given to me for you, and how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I wrote above in a few words, a reading of which will enable you to perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ. In former generations, this mystery was not made known to humankind, as it was now been relieved to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is, the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and shares in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace, that was given to me by the working of his power. Although I am very least of all these saints, this grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So that through the church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance, in accordance with the eternal purpose that he carried out in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have access to God in boldness and confidence through faith in him. I pray, therefore, that you may not lose heart over my sufferings for you. They are your glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks be to God. It's now um, our, our joy and our privilege uh, to welcome Well, good morning. It is certainly my joy and privilege to have this opportunity to bring the word to this congregation. Uh, as Pastor Kevin mentioned, this is the church that I grew up in, and I have some, some memories, uh, obviously. Uh, as he mentioned, I'm currently a seminary student uh, at Reformed Theological Seminary in Northern Virginia, actually at the, the D.C. campus, um, and I'm basically wrapping up my first year um, I have a class coming up in a couple of weeks that will round out that first year. Um, but I recently was uh, writing a paper on this passage, Ephesians 3, and knew I would be home and said, well, why don't I see if I can preach on this passage? Well, <laughs> this is not an easy passage <laughs> at all. Uh, the more that I have thought about this passage, the more confusing it actually has become, even once you get the ideas in their proper order, the ideas that are still there are confusing. So <laughs> that is my challenge this morning, is to hopefully bring something that is understandable to you and that you can at least apply to your own life. Fortunately, this text does contain the word mystery three times. <laughs> so that is a, a big plus. It, occurs six times in Ephesians, uh, but three of those are right here in these 13 verses. But actually, the meaning of mystery is a little bit different from our understanding of it in English, where it typically refers to something that is impossible to explain or something that cannot be understood. And here, it refers more so to something that has been hidden, something that has not yet been revealed. And one commentator actually put this nicely, saying that in Ephesians... Uh, this mystery is actually a treasure that is to be revealed rather than some puzzle to, to be solved. And so in Ephesians 3, this mystery refers to the, the unmanifested or secret plan of God. And this mystery was revealed in and through Jesus Christ 
uh, just at the right time. So there's a, a popular board game uh, called Settlers of Catan, and in this game, the objective is to get to 10 victory points before anybody else. And the way you do that is by collecting resources and using those resources to build cities, settlements, roads, which each contribute to your, your total. Um, but there's another part of the game which allows you to make some special actions, which are these development cards. Uh, there are five types of them, and one of them is a Monopoly card. And if you acquire this card, you're able to, at some point in the game, actually just announce, like, I want all of this one resource, and everybody who's playing the game has to give you that resource. Now, of course, when a player draws that card, they don't actually know, like, the rest of the players don't know what that card is. And so it's hidden. It's a mystery to the rest of the players. But if the player who has the card plays this card correctly and uses it to its full benefit, they'll pay attention to who's collecting a lot of one resource or how much of a single resource is out there so that at the proper time or at the optimal time, they're able to reveal the mystery of that card and collect in abundance something actually to the demise of, of all the others. And that's kind of what's, what's happening here with this mystery of Christ where it, it was not revealed until finally the fullness of time or the optimal time came. And in Ephesians 1, Paul writes of this fullness of time and also announces this overarching mystery, which is a mystery of unity. And so it's worth just reading uh, Ephesians 1, verses 7 through 10, which say, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, the optimal time. And here's the other mystery here being stated, to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. Again, no small task here, uniting all things in heaven and on earth. So that means through Christ, God revealed this mystery of his will, which was to unite all things in heaven and on earth. And the goal this morning is to explore three mysterious aspects of God's character, his wisdom, his grace, and his power, and to see how each of these is bringing about the unity of all things in Christ. And so we can jump right in thinking about his wisdom. And as you would expect, this is a, a challenging endeavor in Ephesians 3. Wisdom is only mentioned once, and there it's described as manifold or many-sided, very much like a, a diamond. And you can imagine if you have a diamond and you're holding it in front of your face, each of those facets representing one of these aspects of God's wisdom, you can only see some of the facets. And if you want to see other facets, you have to turn it. But every time you turn it, you can no longer see some of the other facets. And so to actually comprehend all of God's wisdom is something we, we quite literally cannot wrap our heads around. We can only see parts of it at any given time. But not only is God's wisdom multifaceted and difficult to comprehend that way, but actually in this passage here in Ephesians 3, God's wisdom underlies just a number of ideas that are here. It really underlies the whole passage, but there are even some key words that we, we can look at, like God's plan. He has some plan that, in verse 9, says the plan of the mystery that was hidden for ages in God. And this plan was made with wisdom, but also this word plan even has a couple of things it could mean. Uh, it could just mean the actual content of the plan, like, uh, if you're managing a project in engineering, there would be like a Gantt chart. You have all your different steps laid out. If you're following a recipe, that's a kind of plan. But it can also mean the actual managing of the outworking of that plan. And it seems that both of those ideas are in play. It's God's wisdom in making the plan, but also his wisdom in working out that plan, which involves sending his son to die for our sins, but it was also administered wisely by God. But the second of these, these terms is God's purpose. In verse 11, we see that this was according to the eternal purpose that was realized 
in Christ Jesus. And so God's plan had this purpose, and it was a wise purpose that God had set his mind on from eternity past. And we've already hit on that purpose, which was to unite all things in heaven and on earth in Christ. But then there's also the mystery. And the mystery is clearly defined, actually, in verse 6 for us, uh, where he says that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So again, that theme of unity is present. We can't ignore it. It's everywhere in this passage. But again, the, the Jews and Gentiles were now going to be co-equals in Christ. They're going to be co-equals and also share this unity uh, in the promises that had been made in the past. Uh, so this mystery was kept hidden until Christ, and it revealed God's plan and purpose that had been hidden in ages past. But this was God's wise mystery. And so each of these words, again, is, is closely tied to God's multifaceted wisdom. And the challenge of actually comprehending these lofty ideas draws us into this lifetime journey that we are on together as Christ followers. We are on this quest to actually comprehend the mind of God, and it's even necessary as we're following Christ to actually seek to understand the mind and the wisdom of God as best we can in order to live in accordance with his will. And so it's here and this mysterious and multifaceted nature of God's wisdom that this multi-ethnic church of Jews and Gentiles shares in this common endeavor that will actually unite our hearts. And so first, members of the church endeavor to understand the wisdom of God and apply it into all aspects of life. And this is, again, a common goal that we share. Aspects of God's heart and mind were previously Hidden, they were veiled, but through Christ's ministry, the heart and mind of God have been made more uh, obvious to us. They have been fully revealed and even recorded now in Scripture. We see in verses 3 and 4 that the mystery was made known to me, referring to Paul, by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this by reading, or it could be by reading, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. And so we have this revelation of this mystery that is recorded in Scripture. First came to Paul through revelation, but now we have that revelation and we seek to understand it uh, as well as we can. And seeking this wisdom in Scripture is a common goal that transforms believers to share in that one mind of Christ. But there's a second common goal or purpose that believers share in that is revealed here in this passage, and that is to actually reveal the wisdom of God to all creation, even the heavenly places. Which, again, to wrap your mind around what that means, I'm not going to attempt to explain that this morning. Uh, but verse 10, the purpose of Paul's ministry, bringing the gospel, the unsearchable riches of Christ to the Gentiles, was so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So the church, especially by living according to that one mind of Christ that we're seeking as we seek the wisdom of God, that somehow we're revealing the wisdom of God to all of creation. That's a pretty profound common goal or set of goals that we as a multi-ethnic church are sharing in. But the second uh, characteristic that we need to explore is God's grace. And God's grace is, is mysterious, but this is not because it's something we can't understand, but because the magnitude of his grace was kept hidden until his purpose was revealed in Jesus Christ. Now, to the Jews, it was unthinkable that God would extend his saving hand to anyone other than the Jews. They were, in their own mind, God's elite. His salvation was for them. And even though we can, we can look back at the Old Testament now in in light of this New Testament revelation and perceive clearer indicators that God's desire was always to save people of all nations, the, the Jews missed it. 
Uh, and, and just a couple of examples of these, Genesis 12, 3, in, in you, Abraham, referring to Abraham, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. We also have Isaiah 49, 6, I will make you, Israel, a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. So especially in Isaiah 49, 6, we see at least one aspect of God's grace, which is God's grace for salvation. And this is an aspect of God's grace that is present here in Ephesians, uh, not exactly in this passage, but in, in chapter 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God. And God's gift of grace is a significant contributor to the overall expression of this magnitude of his grace. Right? We see that his grace has this global breadth. His saving grace is not limited to one bloodline, but is for all bloodlines, all peoples of all nations and all tongues. But alongside that breadth of God's salvation, of God's saving grace, we also see that it has a depth to it. Right? Not only does this grace save people across the globe, but it's able to save the worst of sinners. There's no sinner who has sinned too many times or committed crimes that are too heinous that the grace of God cannot intervene and actually save a soul. And this was the case with the Apostle Paul. He persecuted the early church, was seeking to destroy the gospel and the progress of this message of Christ. But then the grace of God intervened and humbled him and turned his heart to Christ and that's why he can say, as he did in verse 8, though I am the very least of all the saints. But there's another aspect of God's grace that we need to consider, especially as, it's, as it appears here in Ephesians 3. And it's one that actually goes against our natural tendencies, one that even goes against a tendency to limit God's grace only to salvation. And that is God's grace for service. Grace accomplishes more than just a personal redemption or a salvation from sin. Grace is also a gift of service. I think it's really easy for us to think that our service and ministry, in whatever capacity that may be, that that's actually our gift to God. But that's, that's wrong. Even our service in ministry, our service which is oriented to God, is a gift of God's grace to us. And it's clearly linked uh, the, the grace of God is clearly linked here in Ephesians 3 to Paul's responsibility to administer the gospel to others. Here we have in verse 2, Paul saying, Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship or the administration or the commission of God's grace that was given to me for you, Paul had a responsibility because of grace. And we also see it in verse 8, This grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Again, this grace came with a responsibility to preach. So I think there's, there's this tendency in the church to think that by you know, attending church on Sunday mornings is, is for my benefit, which we certainly do benefit from gathering, but to think that because of my attendance, God will bless me is, is not quite correct, right? Or the same line of thought can apply to that serving in ministry, that because of my service in the church then, God will, will bless me. And it was only a, a year or two ago that I actually pondered this line of thought in a little more detail, and, and something clicked. Right? This line of thought is contrary to grace. This is much more consistent with a works-reward system where by doing X, I receive Y from God. But it's not that God blesses anyone because of their service in ministry, but that the blessing is actually the service of ministry itself, that the blessing is participating in Sunday worship. So one commentator put this idea really, really well, saying, the gift of grace always comes as a task. Grace always brings responsibility. It is never merely privilege. Paul viewed himself as a manager of grace. His ministry to the Gentiles was unique. But all Christians are to be managers of grace. All who have received grace should extend it to others. To receive grace is to be taken into its service. Grace connects, enlists, and empowers. It will not allow us to be passive, for it is God's power at work in us. And I think this idea of service gives us another opportunity to see 
this example of unity in the body of Christ, especially as we consider spiritual gifts that are specifically for service in ministry. Right? Any spiritual gift is, actually comes from a word that just means grace gifts. And they are gifts that we have a responsibility for using for service in the church, for the edification of the church. And so in 1 Corinthians, when Paul explains spiritual gifts, his emphasis is on unity. He says there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but the same God who empowers them all and everyone. And he goes on to say the body consists of many members and explains that no member of the body is greater than another. Each member is co-equal and essential to the proper function of the body regardless of race, gender, or age. Therefore, as our grace gifts are expressed in service to the church, as we are responsible for using these grace gifts to edify the church, this mystery of unity is revealed both amongst the church but also to the world. So here we can come to the third and final characteristic that we need to explore this morning in relation to the unity that God has revealed in Christ, and that is the power of God. And then the power of God was certainly made known throughout the Old Testament. There's the example of creation, uh, but you also have the Exodus with these plagues and the parting of the Red Sea and other big uh, events like these. But it was not necessarily obvious how this salvation would come to all people of all nations. But this wise plan of God's that was revealed was actually that he would reveal his power through weakness. And the power of God was revealed through the Son of God emptying himself and taking on the form of a human servant. The power of God was made known in Christ's willingness to die on the cross. And yet, more obviously, the power of God was made known in Christ's resurrection. But the effect of this work was, again, profoundly powerful. It brought about unity, and it's a unity with one another, a unity with Christ, and again, ultimately puts us into a service of bringing about that unity. So first, the, the gospel carried with it this power to break down walls of hostility, Walls between nations, walls between individuals who are hostile toward one another. And the clear example of this that Paul has in mind here in Ephesians is between Jews and Gentiles. Um, the Jews, as I've already mentioned, felt they belonged exclusively to, exclusively to God and they had this hostile attitude toward Gentiles who were not to be part of this plan of salvation that God had, at least in their minds. But the gospel is effective and powerful in bringing down that hostility. So Ephesians 2, verses 13 through 16, speaks of Jesus himself being our peace. And goes on to say, Christ, who has made us both Jew and Gentile one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments, expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God and one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. But again, this gospel power does not merely apply to Jews and Gentiles. God can unite any groups at utter hostility with one another. In Christ, the power of the gospel unites Republican and Democrat in Christ, the power of the gospel unites black and white. In Christ, the power of the gospel unites nations at war. And in Christ, the power of the gospel unites victims with their criminals. So in Christ, through his gospel, the power of God is effective in reconciling what seems irreconcilable. But we also see that the gospel carried this power to make enemies of God one with himself, and that is by atoning for their sin, even the worst of sin. And we've already seen that with God's grace, working deep and transforming Paul from persecutor to apostle. But it's here when we think about Paul that this power of God's grace is realized and seen more clearly. Right? The gospel is so powerful and God's grace is so magnificent that 
the working of this grace did not just stop with Paul's change of heart, but it put him into that action. And he was given that ministry to preach this unity of Jews and Gentiles, to actually include Gentiles in all the promises that have been made to the Jews. So in verse 7, which describes Paul's calling, we read, Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. Now, in, in the Greek, the word working here is actually the same word that we get energy from, and power is the word that we actually get dynamite from. So, if you put that together, you get something like the grace to minister was given to Paul by the energy of God's dynamite. Now, that's not to say that God is somehow reckless and set his mind on destruction, but he was doing something that required a miraculous display of power, and he was especially deconstructing the worldview of the Jews in order to construct something far greater, which would be this multi-ethnic church that has this special unity in Christ. And so as I thought about just the idea of God deconstructing worldviews, you know, it might be worthwhile to even consider where we need to have our worldview deconstructed. Perhaps that would be useful every once in a while to just change our perspective. Um, so when I began considering this possibility of seminary, I knew I had to have some idea what denomination I wanted to end up in, and that would require me exploring uh, and really developing my own convictions on a number of theological issues, everything from your Reformed theology, Calvinism, the, the solas, to other issues like are the miraculous gifts like tongues and prophecy for the church today. But it was in this process that I discovered that even within Presbyterian denominations, there are way too many to, to choose from and sift through. Uh, but a, a growing conviction of mine has been a need for a more interdenominational interaction, not only between these many Presbyterian denominations, but between all Christian denominations, because even the world sees all these Christian denominations and sees division, which is not what the church is for. That's not what this mystery of unity is meant to uh, you know, lead to. So unity is not some non-essential or some afterthought, but is the very heart of our faith. We, we're not asked to like other Christians or to be like them or to agree with them, but to recognize that we are one with them and share the same Lord and the same benefits. So this is the mystery of unity that we are left to ponder. It's a message that, though it has been revealed, is still so difficult to wrap our minds around. God's desire to unify in Christ according to his wisdom, his grace, and his power is a marvelous mystery. And so I could think of no better way to close this message than by just reading from the, basically the doxology that is in Romans 11. And it says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending Jesus. We thank you for uh, his ministry of reconciliation and for revealing yourself, revealing your character, your wisdom, your grace, your power in and through him. Lord, we thank you for uniting us in that and Holy Spirit, we ask that you would help us to walk in unity, to seek unity, to especially seek the wisdom and mind of Christ as one. Father, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Lord God Almighty. together uh, what we believe using um, as our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed, uh, which you can find um, printed in your bulletin and should be on your screen for those worshiping at home. Let us together uh, say what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As we have heard in Ephesians 3, verse 7, the Apostle Paul reflects on his call. Of this gospel I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the working of his power. In response to the love and good news of Jesus Christ, let us consider the gifts of time, talent, or resources we have received in God's grace and how we can live into our calling as stewards of them for the Lord. If giving to the ministry of this church is a way for you to respond to God in this way, there is an offering plate by the door as you leave after the service. And online giving cards are in the pews for use for those who give online. Those worshiping at home can use the online giving option of our website or mail your offerings into the church office. In all the ways we are called, let us give as those who are stewards of God's grace. Mm -hmm. 
do we stand for the doxology? <laughs> or no? Yeah, right. <laughs> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Let us pray. Generous God, we give you thanks for all your blessings to us. Use these gifts we offer as a sign of your great love for the world so that all may know and share in the abundance of your grace. In your holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As we uh, prepare to go to the Lord uh, in, in prayer, uh, before we do that, I just want to draw your attention to uh, some of the announcements, some of what's going on in the life of the church um, you can find all of the weekly announcements in the, I think it's a mint green insert this week in your bulletin. Um, and uh, for those worshiping at home, there's a link on our website to all the announcements. Uh, but I do want to highlight a few of them, um, some, things, some, um, some great things coming up. Um, we have our next time working with uh, Woonsocket Community Meal um, the weekend of, uh, of June 25th, that Saturday, uh, we are going to be making lunches uh, to be distributed uh, the, the following Sunday on the 26th, um, and we will be making lunches here uh, on the 25th, that Saturday at 10 a.m. Um, if you're interested and able to, to help with that, uh, you can talk with, uh, with Betty Conlon um, here, or uh, you can contact the church office and we'll get you the information that you need, but uh, Saturday, uh, June 25th. At 10 a.m., we'll be making lunches uh, for the Woonsocket community meal. Uh, and then on that, sun, that, that Sunday, June 26th, uh, is our recognition Sunday uh, and also our church picnic. So please mark your calendars uh, for that. Uh, also coming up this summer, um, we have uh, our, our week helping out at the Northern Rhode Island Food Pantry on July 14th, 15th, and 16th. Uh, if you mark your calendars and if you're able to help out, uh, there's particular hours on those days. You can find that in the announcements. Um, uh, but uh, if you're able to help out at the, the food pantry, uh, those are the next times that we're going to be, uh, be able to volunteer there. And then Vacation Bible School, July 18th through the 22nd. Um, it'll be 9 to noon on those that week. Um, it will be uh, the time of the of VBS. Uh, we still have volunteer opportunities, both leading up to and during that week. So if you're if you're able, please let us let us know. Uh, and we have registration forms. So if um, if you know of uh, an elementary school age uh, child who would love to come to VBS, um, or if you're a parent who would love your child to come to VBS. Uh, the registration forms are in the narthex there. Um, those who are worshiping online, contact the church office and we'll make sure that, uh, that you can get registered that way. Uh, finally, I wanted to just highlight something that's coming up in the life of our uh, denomination. Um, the Presbyterian Church USA, our General Assembly uh, is this year. This is the, the national gathering for our denomination that happens every two years. Um, this year is uh, it is July eight or excuse me June eighteenth through July 9th. It's normally crammed into one week, but this year it's a, it's going to be hybrid. There's some uh, people who are participating in person and online, and so they've kind of stretched it out a little bit uh, for those those weeks. Um, if you're curious about some of what goes on at the General Assembly, um, Presbytery send commissioners uh, to to do the work of the the national church, the denomination. Um, there's on the table in the narthex, there's a little uh, sheet with some information about stuff that uh, is probably going to be coming up um, at the General Assembly to be discussed and uh, discerned and, and voted on. Uh, that's not the sum total, but that's kind of just some, some highlights. Um, and there's, uh, there's a link in the, the announcements uh, where you can, a website where you can keep track. Uh, and it's all, most of it's going to be live stream, so if you're curious about what that is, you can tune in on the live stream. Um, and I bring that up just as a reminder to, um, as, as Jordan was saying, we belong to each other. Uh, and this is one way our, our particular denomination is connected. We're connected to churches around the country through this. Uh, and then through the denomination, we are connected to other denominations um, around the world. Uh, and so a lot of the work that goes on is about the broader church um, 
So uh, it's something to, to keep in your prayers. Um, pray for the, the work that's being done um, there at the General Assembly. Uh, and just, uh, just be aware, it is a, it is a good thing uh, to be connected to each other in a lot of these ways, that unity uh, that Jordan was talking about. So those are uh, some of what's going on in the life of the church, and now it is, uh, it is time for us to do um, what is a big part of the work of the church, uh, and that is to uh, join together in, in prayer uh, for, uh, for each other, uh, for our communities, and indeed for the world. Uh, so as we do that, uh, are there any um, prayer requests, any joys or concerns to be shared this morning? Kathy. Kathy. And that, that is that is Andy and Nicole. Nicole. And then Phoebe and Samuel. And that family is uh, is now I remember they were that was in the plans a while ago. And COVID uh, put a pause in that. Um, but now they are they are in India now. We will as missionaries we'll certainly keep them in our prayers. There are any others? Betty. I have to go into the hospital tomorrow to be regulated on a medication to control my heart rate. Prayers for that. Absolutely, Betty. That's tomorrow. Um, for a few days. For a few days. Uh, you'll be in the hospital, and we will uh, certainly keep you in our prayers. There are others. Is that a no? Oh, yes. yes, okay. I just have a joy. Um, the doctors uh, that cared for me were absolutely driven by God's hand. And through your prayers and thanks and calls and cards, it has sustained me immeasurably. And I want to thank everyone. <gasps> That wasn't you. <laughs> there was major feedback. Why? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I'm magic. Yeah. <laughs> As Lindy, your, your joy throughout um, the, the care from doctors and friends and congregation um, through some health things. And we, give, we give thanks, absolutely, yes. Are there others? Maybe that was a sign to go ahead and pray. So uh, we're going we're, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna to do that. Holy God, one in three and three in one, hear us as we pray now as your people. Holy triune God, hear our prayers this morning. Lord, we pray for the church. We give thanks for the work of the church. We give thanks for evidence, um, especially this morning. We are grateful for, for Jordan um, and to bring uh, your word this morning, uh, even though he now lives, uh, lives far away in another part of the country. We are grateful uh, for the connection that maintains um, between him and, and this congregation uh, and the way that you have spoken through him this morning. Lord, we ask your continued blessing uh, as he continues his, his seminary studies and that you would prepare him for the ministry that you have in store. And help us all, indeed, Lord, help us all to heed your call and follow your way in our lives. Let us know your love and live into our faith, laying our fears and our failures, our joys and our successes, all of it in your hands. And we pray, especially in these weeks, for our denomination, as those you have called from us to meet in the General Assembly, Lord, may you guide and direct, speak your voice, that we may be a people who proclaim the gospel, provide for the shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship of all your children, that we may worship you well, 
preserving the truth of the gospel and bearing witness to and living into your justice and righteousness, your grace and your mercy, and exhibiting in the ways that we can the kingdom of heaven to the world. Holy triune God, hear our prayer. We pray for the world. Lord, where there is hatred and bloodshed, fighting and mistrust, drought and disease, Lord, give peace, reconciliation, and healing. We pray for the leaders of the nations, ours and those of others. Lord, may they lead in paths of justice and mercy with humility. And for the peoples of the world, Lord, may your peace, your shalom be our goal and our means. Holy triune God, hear our prayer. And we pray for this community. Lord, bless the neighbors that call this place home, those beyond these walls who have no home, and strangers unknown to us but loved so deeply by you. Lord, may we cultivate such communities that no one need go to bed or to school or to work or to home in fear. For the hungry and hungering in our midst, for the ignored or passed by, for the oppressed or persecuted, for the poor and poor in spirit. Lord, upon them shine your gracious and life-giving light and open our eyes that we may do the same. Holy triune God, hear our prayer. And we pray for loved ones. Be with those who are near and far away those who are facing new challenges in life, those who are wrestling with the same challenges that seem to come back again and again, and be with those who are searching for signs of hope. We lift up to you now, Lord, our church family, Barbara and Lydia, Linda and Elaine, Matt and Miriam, Dot and Val, Fran and Linda, and Betty. And we lift up to you our family and friends, Debbie's friend Diane, and her friend Carol's son Kevin, Judy's brother, Miriam's sister, Terry's daughter-in-law, and Jared, and Trudy's co-worker Nicole and Mike and her neighbor Michelle, Jennifer's mother and DA's nephew, and Kathy's family, Andy, Nicole, Phoebe, and Samuel, as they are beginning this journey that is a long time coming as missionaries in India. We continue to pray for Linda, and we give thanks with joy for the way you have watched over her through, um, through prayers and the, the, the work and community of this place and doctors and friends and your very spirit at work. We lift up to you, Lord, now in this mo moment of silence. We lift up to you all those who are known to each of us. And we offer also a moment that are given for those who are known only to you. Lord, hear our prayers this morning. Holy triune God, hear our prayer. For all this we ask of you, Lord God, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, as we are bold to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
I invite you now to stand uh, and sing, as we sing our closing hymn, hymn number 139, Come Thou Almighty King. feedback in the sanctuary that seeks to drown out our praise, but let us praise anyway, knowing that the love of God the Father, the grace of Jesus the Son, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with you now and forevermore. Amen.